All right, welcome everyone. Um, DAG's monthly meeting for September of 2022. I'm Eli Storch, the chair of the Design Advocacy Group. Um, one thing we like to do when we're in person that we're trying to do again is uh, introduce ourselves. So if in the sake of uh, being here to talk about public spaces and parklets and streeteries, if you want to introduce yourself in the chat, uh, put your name, put your favorite public space in Philadelphia, and if you're, if you're feeling fancy, put in uh, your favorite public space outside of Philadelphia as well, um, so we can all get to, to see and get to know each other a little bit better. Um, get in touch with me if you have any technical difficulties. I'll do my best to, to help you out. Um, and as we were talking about before this began, um, we used to be off the record, but um, DAG meetings are now on the record because we have Zoom and the ability to record and share and, and pass around this information. Um, so if you go on our website, going back, I wanna say almost two years at this point, um, we've been recording these. So there's a lot of content on the events page of our website. Um, so you can go check that out and, uh, and yeah, enjoy and, and follow up with us. Um, we uh, do not have Marsha with us, so I'll, I'll drop a little bit on our next program, which will be uh, a bunch of folks who are working on the Spring Garden Connector. We're going to come and talk about that project and, and how, that, uh, how that is proceeding and, and the, the path to getting that uh, constructed and, and successfully uh, put together. So that's going to be a really exciting one, and we have a couple more things that will be uh, going up uh, for that. The information on who is um, Ariel, the presenters, I have their names, I will pull them all up in a second um, and, and get that information into the chat. Um, so before we get started, uh, advocacy items. George, do you want to give a little update on uh, UC townhomes and where everything, uh, where everything sits with that, to your knowledge? Yes, uh, just on muting. Um, very, very difficult. Uh, situation. We have done two articles, neither of which was picked up uh, despite our best efforts by the Inquirer or Planned Philly, and I hold that against them more than I hold it against myself or, or my co-author uh, on the second paper, Eli. Uh, we put a lot of effort into thinking about uh, UC townhomes and how the site could potentially take some additional density uh, without relocating people, but also we feel that it's very, very important for the three uh, beneficiaries of the original clearance that goes back to the, the 60s uh, to stand up and ask for an equitable solution here. They don't own the property. They have, I suppose, the right to be passive and just watch, watch this train wreck uh, from the distance but the original clearance was done for their benefit and they've benefited enormously. I mean, they have the Science Center is now a thriving location and they're worried about not having enough sites available. Um, and all three organizations say that they're very much interested in uh, diversity and equity. And here's a chance to demonstrate it in real life. <laughs> And they're, they're standing aside. We were, we were very heartened uh, to hear only yesterday that the uh, Asian students at Penn managed to get an audience with the senior administration at Penn to advocate that Penn take a stance on this. Uh, we have received some interest or some communication, not interest in working necessarily with DAG, but some interest from a, an organization in uh, Massachusetts in Boston that uh, tries to uh, preserve uh, affordable housing. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult situation because the, the property owner is acting within uh, their rights, and we have stated that publicly. Um, and yet, uh, we don't believe the uh, apparent solution of uh, ending the Section 8 agreement and evicting the, the tenants is the wisest solution by any means. Uh, so we're part of a large group of uh, organizations with many different positions. Some of the organizations, all of which share one 
single position, which is the tenants should not be leaving the site, should not have to leave the site. Uh, some people feel that uh, someone, whether the city of Philadelphia or University of Pennsylvania or some other organization should simply buy the site. Uh, and there's been a rumor that the site is worth as much as 100 million, which seems uh, rather excessive. Um, so there, there's, there's a variety of positions, but all of them have a, a, as their commonality that the tenants should not have to leave. Uh, I thought the tenants had been evicted a long time ago or had received eviction notices. And one of the activists informed me uh, when I wrote about that um, in a question email said, no, the, the, they actually have not yet been served their eviction notices. Uh, and I don't think that, that will happen or cannot happen until October 8th. It was going to be authorized as of September 7th, but they got another month. Uh, we do think among other things that would be very nice if they happened, if they got another six months uh, to a year, uh, the thing is now heated up to the point where I think a solution would be possible. Uh, I don't know what that solution would be, but I think it's, it's possible. So it's a very, very uh, fraught situation. Um, our local government, city council and the executive branch have been very, very quiet on this. And I hope they're working behind the scenes. Uh, in our research, we found some disturbing things like that the planning commission had suggested a hotel for that site uh, as part of the uh, West Philadelphia plan. And they hadn't bothered to mention that to the tenants on the site. Uh, and council, of course, some has been very quiet uh, in part because they've been sued uh, regarding a zoning change they've made to the site, uh, which uh, the uh, property owner feels has damaged their value. Uh, so there's, there's a lot going on, uh, but a lot of it is beneath the surface and we're anxious to uh, advocate our position. Our biggest position is that these three beneficiary organizations should stand up and seek uh, a solution. Not that Penn should buy it or that they should wave a magic wand and make the problem go away, uh, but that the, the three institutions are very powerful, have uh, a lot of uh, support within our community. They've certainly generated a lot of jobs and a lot of very good results, but here's something concrete uh, that is uh, a need. And I just want to end by reminding everybody that the original clearance basically eliminated a thriving uh, African-American neighborhood called the Black Bottom. Uh, and that uh, cleared the land that lay fallow for many years and was very hard to develop, which is now in high demand for the University City Science Center. I could go on quite a bit further, but I don't think that's appropriate. Uh, any, I'd be glad to take any questions or any further discussion in the comments too, in the chat. Appreciate it, George. Um, if there's any follow-up uh, or you wanna get more involved, please let us know and we'll, we'll connect you to the right people. Um, to Ariel's question before, we have Patrick Starr coming in October from the Pennsylvania Environmental Council, uh, Elizabeth Lankow from the city, um, and we have Daniel Pascal from East Coast Greenway Alliance. Um, and they're gonna be here on uh, October 27th at our regular morning slot to, uh, to give the DAG monthly presentation. So we're gonna jump in, not our, our straight traditional one speaker, one Q&A. We have uh, three presentations about uh, public space today. So I wanna give it uh, over to Eric Devera who you have undoubtedly seen somewhere around the city doing, doing good, uh, uh, waving the flag for these causes, um, currently with, uh, with Philadelphia 250, um, but known best to me at least as, as uh, the person in charge of Parking Day Philadelphia. So Eric, I will ask you to unmute and take it away. Absolutely. Um, 
it's it, it's it's quite it's quite a joy to hear you say that because there are still people who don't know it's me who who runs parking day and i i relish in that i'm kind of like under the radar this whole time <laughs> Um, so yes, thank you so much for having me. My name is Eric Devera. Um, I'm currently with Philadelphia 250, but I have actually been running Parking Day for 10 years now. This year is my is my decade year. And so um, I, I just wanted to share a little bit of Parking Day um, throughout the years. Um, and I know I see that Kat Kendon is here. Um, she became our official photographer in 2017. So a uh, majority of the beautiful photos that you see this evening are from, from Kat. Um, and so it, it's also been a joy for, you know, to be able to really kind of like document this. Uh, if you've been a parking day participant uh, during the after party, it used to be a matter of emailing photos, put together a slideshow and by the evening, here we were um, showing how everybody um, what everybody did that day. And so it's been, it's been quite the journey and it has evolved over time. Right. So I tend to like, just show these beautiful, beautiful photos. Um, but in the beginning, really the history of parking day, um, originated in San Francisco in 2005. And um, by an art collective called Rebar as a way to reimagine the potential of the metered parking space. Um, in 2006, the Trust of Public Land became the national sponsor of Parking Day, which expanded this event through the US and internationally. This allowed Parking Day to become a global exploration of the creative potential of streets. Uh, this annual event celebrates parks and other pedestrian friendly spaces in all cities and also raises awareness of the need to the need for more of these spaces for public interaction. Here in, uh, here in Philadelphia, we actually, our first parking day was in 2008, um, thanks to people like Pamela Zimmerman of Zimmerman uh, Studios. Um, it was extremely successful in that beginning. We, there were about almost 30 teams um, that constructed spaces citywide to listen to music, to relax, play games, um, even experienced prototypical bike share, which, so that was 2008. And because of that, uh, during that time, you know, we also partnered with Philadelphia Parking Authority as well as AI Philadelphia. So this is why a lot of our parks, um, for some of you that follow Parking Day, um, you'll find our, or many of our architects, landscape architects, um, a lot of our design firm, other design firms, engineering firms, um, even folks in, um, in, in furniture. Um, and here you'll see some of our partners have been throughout the years, community, the Community Design Collaborative. We've looked to them for design reviews. Um, the Center for Architecture eventually became the home for Parking Day as part of their public programming. And then of course, Kendon Photography. So before beer gardens and pop-ups, I did, um, as now a resident of Philadelphia for almost 16, 16 18 years, um, but, you know, we found in recent years of the beer garden and pop-ups. And sometimes I'd like to think, I'd like to think that parking day was a little bit part of that. We found that throughout those years, some of these uh, designers that were behind our Spruce Street Harbor Park um, over by Dilworth Park were people that participated in Parking Day um, in its early years and were, constant, um, were, were constantly testing out um, different methods to occupy space, whether it was like as you see with cones um, to even uh, tires to uh, containers. Um, and so for one day, for one day out of the year, between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m., um, you got to experience 160 square feet of, of interaction, of play. I will also, uh, I will also note that uh, the, the Horticultural Society also participated, and that was before all the, pop -up, the neighborhood pop-up gardens that we had. So another thing to think about is that because of Parking Day, 
we also found kind of like new and organized public spaces are really kind of owed to neighborhood engagement here. These are folks um, getting ready for parking day over at Frida um, at their cafe. It's been, even though we've had a heavily, um, a heavily designed parking day around architects and landscape architects and engineers, we have slowly been encouraging and it's definitely been one of my efforts to begin to encourage people who are not in that space to participate. So this is their cafe over in Fourth Street. Um, so they were doing construction days prior to the day of and this was their parkland. But then you'd also find um, in order to really also kind of push making sure many of the different neighborhoods are participating you know it was always the accessibility point of saying you come as you are here are a few guidelines and sometimes it's been surprising where some people are in complete shock that there aren't too many there aren't too many guidelines but it's only for your safety um, here this space right here this particular parking day um, that we're, we're seeing here we've also had folks like dill Dilworth Plaza when it was right before its renovation time we're also like sharing with the public what's coming up in those spaces. Um, this one's from the Bicycle Coalition of Greater Philadelphia, the bike corrals. Parking day was used as a also a place to premiere new spaces, pedestrian friendly spaces. Um, here right here is the Fishtown Rose Garden, um, this triangular area which I would say right before the pandemic, like the 2019 parking day, the neighborhood association claimed that space for, for parking day and began talking to the neighbors. And it then turned into this, that conversation and that installation and intervention has turned into this now public space, much more beautiful than it was. And then you heard me earlier, even in 2008, they were showing prototypes of bike share. This one was in 2016, when by the spring um, was the premiere of our bike share. So one thing that's always interesting is people tend to ask whether or not Philadelphia were, was the original parking day. And I always have to preface like, no, we weren't. But what we have been doing is that we have been consistent. The only time we have missed parking day was 2020. And with that, it's the only day that I can predict the weather. There's usually no rain. It may be a little bit hot, maybe a little cool, but there is never rain. Um, so I'd like to pride myself that that's, I, I can only predict one day of good weather for sure. Um, but again, because of this, we've also found people that have participated with us end up bringing parking day to other places. Shortly after the recession, we had folks that, um, you know, because we do welcome citizens, your average citizens, businesses um, to participate, they moved to Alaska the following year and asked, okay, how do I start this? We've even had phone calls from folks in Brazil, folks who are in DC, folks in Chicago, people were, you know, cities that you would have thought it's like, I. I would have thought they would have already had this parking day, but they call us because we have been consistent about this. I also think why we tend to engage many of our own citizens here is that it's in its initial intention of, you know, guerrilla, guerrilla design was that there's just enough structure to give people parameters of what kind of space they want to make and as well as enough freedom for them to do anything that they want. Um, so you're seeing here quite a mix of like the archives and as well as, you know, when the pandemic hit, I remember a few folks reaching out to me. It's like, so what do you think about these streeteries? I'm like, we've been trying to talk about this since 2008. Um, and it has been, it's been tried out this whole time. But then parking day today and tomorrow. Um, by today, you know, it started with approximately almost 30 parks in 2008. After that, it has continued to grow. When I started taking, um, organizing parking day, um, 
I remember it was the fifth year and my goal was to reach 50 parks. And we have always been around 50 parklets. Sometimes that meant even more organizations because people would partner, begin to partner up. Um, or organizations would begin to take over several different blocks. One of our roles is one park per block. Um, and so we started to see that growth and it was very exciting. And then the pandemic hit. Um, and we wanted to keep everyone safe. So we took a little break. And so last year we brought people back, you know, still, still distance. I mean, that was also the perk of parking day is that it is an outside event. Um, it's for one day and we can do it distanced. Um, but it hasn't been the same. Now that we're coming back, we're kind of back at our numbers from the beginning that I'm hoping that eventually we'll see more and more neighborhoods participate. Um, it's even to the point, again, back to like being uh, a legitimate location for a parking day. We have different cities, folks from the South Jersey area or folks in the greater Philadelphia area asking, can we participate with you? I was like, yes, by all means. Um, here's a little bit of like how, you know, how the year, you know, some of our important dates, how our year usually starts. The call usually starts around um, May or June. Um, I remember my first parking day. Um, I went to a July, a July meeting at the Center for Architecture and Design. Um, and after that, I had joined um, Pam and I just raised my hand. I'd be the designated person to organize it. And I've been organizing it ever since. So like I said, um, at the end of August, we make sure everyone is all signed up. We work with, we still continue to work with the PPA. Um, there are no longer any meters to be bagged, but um, that is still a, a partnership there with the no stopping signs for folks that um, remember parking wars, also kind of around that time when parking day started, that was going on. Um, and then we, you know, work with the community design collaborative so that we can bring our community to get our community together um, to to share insight, to share um, how do we interact with um, the public during parking day. And then, of course, we always have our official map. Um, and so you can see these are one of like this was one of those years where it was just everything was populated and it was great. I mean, some people have even kind of associated us around the time of Occupy Philly had asked us during that that week, is this Occupy? I was like, no. Will you be here next year? Of course. So um, for some folks, for the most part, have always been very supportive of Parking Day. Every day you get um, most visitors that know about Parking Day greet us happy, happy Parking Day as if it's our birthday. And then you tend to get one or two who, who tend to raise their hand and say, that would have been a better parking spot. But really, was it? So with that, we celebrate tomorrow between 8 a.m. And, 8 and 5 p.m. around the city. Um, I invite you also to join us at the after party at the Center for Architecture and Design. Um, and with that, I take any of your questions. Yeah, put them in the chat. I I will say I'm a huge fan. I was at that first year of parking day. I did two parklets and I have been on two I teams remember. three times. Um, and it's, it is a wonderful day and it is an opportunity to either, you know, flex your design muscles or yeah. advocate for, for important causes. And it is a, it is a, yeah, it's a wonderful community event. Eli, so any Eli, I'm pretty sure you're the first one to like make it okay to have dogs at parklets because I remember distinctly when you were working with uh oh you even showed it over at City Hall it's like after that year there were a few more dog parklets that came about that year and then the next year all the, all the dogs from both Morris Arbor or Morris um shelter and the Pennsylvania SPCA all got adopted same day so it was uh and that was how I met my good friend Kat Kendon who is now a DAG <laughs> steering committee member so so thank you for coming to share. And uh, I, I appreciate the insight. I hope folks will go out and, and check that out. Yeah, um, and, okay. and part of the, the ongoing parking day celebration and, and discussion of, of public spaces. Um, so Streetbox Philadelphia, Streetbox PHL uh, founded by Ariel Ben Amos is gonna be at the Center for Architecture with the Community Design Collaborative tomorrow. Um, having they have a symposium called Take the Lane. So Ariel uh, just put a link in the chat. 
Um, come, come on here, Ariel. Tell us a little bit about Streetbox PHL. Tell us a little bit about what you have going on. And uh, I put your Eventbrite link in there as well. Um, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Tell tell us all what's going on. Sure. Let me. Uh, I'll, I'll 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 take a moment to share a screen. Um, if you'll give me a moment to adjust. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, here we go. Full screen. Um, so, hi, thank you very much. So, so tomorrow on Parking Day, we decided to celebrate Parking Day. Um, parking Day is really amazing and, and seeing Eric's 10 years of work on this reminds me about how powerful capacity is and how powerful and how important it is to have networks of people dedicated to public space management over the long haul, especially within the right of way. And at Streetbox PHL, I'll tell you more about us shortly. Uh, we care deeply about the civic stewards and making it easier for them to transform Philadelphia's public space. So I'm hoping you can make it out tomorrow. Technically, you should register, but we're happy to have you come on by. Uh, nonetheless, start uh, doors open at 12. We start talking. We have a great uh, symposium started kicking off with Taya Wynn of the Design Collaborative, uh, who actually created my favorite parklet. It was the long lost Logan parklet that uh, had used one to two parking spaces and created three different rooms and served five different purposes outside of a library in North Philadelphia. Um, so she'll be joined by Alex Gilliam of Tiny WPA, who has been consistently pushing the boundaries on what can be legally permitted in the right of way, working with communities to create seesaws uh, in, 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 in the parking lane. Uh, and finally, we'll be joined in the morning by Dwayne Drummond of Mantua Civic Association, who's been a tireless advocate for his community and talking about really communicating the needs for uh, justice and right of way activation uh, for, for all communities. Uh, later after that, we're gonna be joined by Zabe Bent from NACTO, the National Association of City Transportation Officials. Uh, the federal government is under, uh, is, is changing the MUTCD, the Manual Uniform Traffic Code of Control Devices. I mangled that somehow, you'll, you'll forgive me. Um, and what you'll notice when you start reading the MUTCD that it's easier to put up a sign saying warning moose crossings than to say protected bike lane or protected tur right turn lane for bicyclists. Uh, and so she'll be talking about how traffic rules and federal policy impact us and our ability uh, to, to really steward civic spaces in the right of way, like the painted intersections that we saw CMAC do recently. Um, and she'll be in conversation with Mike Carroll, the deputy director, deputy managing director for uh, transportation infrastructure and sustainability. And finally, we're gonna head out to Chinatown and, um, and, and take a tour of some great public spaces on 10th and Vine. Um, so that's what we're doing tomorrow. And we're doing that tomorrow uh, for a variety of reasons. We're doing it tomorrow because um, it's parking day. We're doing it tomorrow because our city has over 14,000 football fields worth of public space. Our sidewalks and roads represent the single public, largest public asset in our, it, that, that we have the right to as citizens. Um, and it is a complex regulatory environment that's really difficult to deal in. And I think many of you on this, on this very call know just exactly how complicated it is. And in some parts, it's because it's the intersection of community development and traffic engineering. And there's nothing messier than the intersection of traffic engineering and community development. Um, we're at a very specific time in, the, in, in Philadelphia's life cycle. Uh, we're, we're entering into a, a mayoral race and, and there are going to be many people uh, articulating visions for what our city's mobility, our city's environment and our city's built environment needs to look like. And so Streetbox PHL wanted to get out there in advance and articulate and really advocate for right-of-way stewards. We've been doing this for some time now. Um, we helped Bartram's Garden legalize this bench. It cost Bartram's Garden $850 to purchase the bench. Uh, I had to spend $1,000 to get a survey for the bench, and I got $1,600 easily of, of, of engineer time donated to Streetbox PHL, which is to take, it costs three times as much to legalize a bench as it does to buy a bench. Um, and that's just insane. And that's due to how we require um, benches to be legalized in the city. We also helped uh, WPA and the Ralston Center ensure these benches. 
Whenever you're putting anything to the right of way, you have to insure it. We know that University City District spends upwards of $5,000 a year to insure its portfolio of street furniture. Uh, and when you, when you start levying this requirement on community groups, you limit who's able to do it. So if we really want to invest in equity and equitable public space, we need to reduce the insurance burden. Um, I'm showing you a diagram of, an, of, of, of a public space that I've not yet been able to get, get, um, get permitted yet. Uh, it's a long, complicated story, but the fact of the matter is when you're designing in the public realm and you're not doing something that's typical, it takes longer. You have much more design uncertainty um, and your process goes by, you lose capacity, you lose momentum. Um, and so we, what, what university, what, excuse me, Streetbox PHL has done, we've legalized benches, we have insured benches, and we've invested in community groups building public space. And so we want to be able to have a chance to let those stories, uh, elevate those stories, because if you don't elevate these stories, if our politicians don't understand the community groups need, literally, they need a street furniture library, right? We need to be able to provide tools and clear guidance. Um, we all know how hard it is to figure out what city what city officials are trying to say. And in a past life, I've tried to say those, those very design guidance and it's difficult and you need help. Um, and if we are able to create better design guidance, if we are able to invest in communities and reduce insurance burdens, we open up the possibility for a whole lot more streets to be invested in. You're looking here at a map that we did in 2015 that looked at need and capacity. Need is defined by presence on the high injury network. Need defined as being on a walkable commercial corridor. Um, and capacity is defined by do you hold block parties? Is there a CDC with an over million dollar budget within a mile radius of a block? And you start seeing a map in Philadelphia that doesn't look like the typical map we always see. And if we make these investments in these blocks alone, we can make it safer and more attractive for 600,000 travelers driving through these, these specific city streets. And so that's why I'm hoping you're gonna join us tomorrow in person at Center for Architecture. There's, there, there's a parking day installation right outside. Um, and we'll be, able to, we'll be able to keep the conversation going and make sure that the next generation of politicians uh, that is happening at a point of record investment from the federal government and expanding streets department will really, really be able to take care of that momentum and help uh, give concrete back to communities. Wonderful. Um, I'll be there. I'm looking forward to it. Um, LRK, we designed the, the park little, that'll be outside of the CFA tomorrow. So we'll be uh, over there uh, talking about that one as well. Um, so let, so if you have questions for Ariel, throw them in the chat. We'll, we'll get them answered. Um, but we're also going to pivot right now um, from out and out public space to the conversation of public space turned private space as we look at streeteries. So um, Kat Gendon, who's on the phone or on the call here, uh, came to, to DAG and had some uh, wanted to get into, wanted to get really deep into streeteries. There was a lot happening in the pandemic to, to make outdoor dining happen and happen well uh, and happen in a way that would uh, support our restaurant industry. Um, but ultimately, people loved it. It was wonderful. And so the question became, as these things become more permanent, um, how does that happen? What does that look like? Uh, and and was happy to welcome Kat to DAG uh, to develop a, a streeteries working group. Um, and through um, my firm LRK, we were able to bring on two interns um, who were able to uh, who were able to help us out. Uh, so we have David Kim and Richard Sedende. David is a uh, a planning student uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. Richard uh, left us to head back out to uh, State College, where he is. Nearly, I uh, got a couple. What do you have? Two more years at, at Penn State in the architecture program, um, and and we task these guys uh, with digging into the research with us, looking at other cities' precedents, and and helping us to develop some uh, some best practices that that we as DAG felt were were appropriate and and 
could be shared with uh, community stakeholders, politicians, and other, other city figures. So David, let me pass it over to you uh, to kick off uh, and I'll let you and, and uh, Richard walk us through uh, where we are and where, where you think we're going. All right, thank you, Eli, for the very thorough introduction. So, so we've done pretty much a quarter of our presentation, but um, just for clarification, we're gonna start right over. My name is David Kim. Um, I'm here with Richard, uh, and uh, this was a project that we did during our internship for the summer with LRK. And I'm very happy to introduce the Philadelphia Street Reads Project to everyone here. All right, so um, before we go into the presentation, just want to introduce a very simple agenda. Uh, first, we're gonna define, you know, we're gonna touch upon what are street reads, you know, introducing our project. And then second, we're gonna talk about how we molded our process, which involves, you know, who were the stakeholders involved, the research and the design explorations that we did. And then finally, we're gonna talk about our deliverables and, uh, and uh, kind of the identific identification of the best practices that we created into a graphic format. All right, so to start us off, what exactly are street reads? Now, a large number of people here um, will probably know what street reads are. I mean, if you walked around the streets of Philadelphia, they're kind of everywhere. Um, and so street reads just kind of introduced to anyone who may not know, you know, it's across the word street and eateries. Um, and it's to, it, it's uh, basically, it's restaurants going out onto the parking spaces in front of their restaurants to uh, create additional seating for uh, customers. Now, the reason why this came, uh, this happened uh, was because of the coronavirus pandemic. With a lot of restrictions going in for public dining indoors, the city kind of gave a lifeline to the restaurant owners of Philadelphia to uh, create these streeteries, uh, outdoor dining areas, which don't need to follow the very stringent indoor restrictions at that time. Now, uh, when they introduced this, Philadelphia saw a lot of success. A lot of people love these streeteries, like they felt like it should be a permanent thing. So in 2021, the, I believe the, the city of Philadelphia released legislation to make these streeteries permanent. However, um, before we go into that, here's a, just, just to prove the point, here's just a lot of streeteries, examples all from Philadelphia that show just how much variety there is in the types of streeteries that can be found around the city. And it's no wonder that people really started appreciating these streeteries for the unique characters they started to bring into the city. But as always, um, this is a project where we're trying to push for street reads. And the reason why is there's a dark side to this. You know, there, uh, as much as people really enjoy these street reads, and um, as much as the, the, the city wanted to, uh, the, the city released for legislation, the new regulations that the city released weren't exactly in line or seeing eye to eye with like the main users and the main builders of these street reads. Uh, regulations were ambiguous. Uh, if you are a new streetery owner, if you're a restaurant owner, for example, if you want to build a streetery, you will be surprised to find if you go, it's like uh, the first step would be, oh, if I want a streetery, I probably have to get it permitted. Well, if you go to the Philadelphia website for license and inspections, there is no section on streetery. There is not even a word called streetery. The closest you can get is a sidewalk cafe license, which entails very different parameters. So, you know, we have that unclearness there, we have these articles starting to come up about, you know, Aristotle owners being very concerned of, about the state of, you know, the future of their streetery. You know, it's, uh, it's giving them a lot of revenue. It, it's, it's providing an identity and a service for the city, but it seems kind of counterintuitive in terms of the regulations that the city has released that's really, really limiting these spaces. Um, and before we kind of dive deeper into the project, I'd like to make, uh, we'd like to make the acknowledgements of the, the people who helped us throughout this process. Um, the Streeteries Working Group really helped us out in terms of research, in terms of communication, in terms of uh, the resources that they provided to us in terms of insights, as well as just uh, this interesting information that uh, they, they just pointed us in the direction to. So um, in collaboration with the Design Act, at 50 Group, Kendo Photography, University City District, among other, uh, among many others, we'd like to just uh, thank them for helping us out for this process. So we want to create, so we figured with all these problems happening with this like unclearness around street rates, how to build street rates, we thought, okay, so how exactly are we going to um, address this? How, what, what are we going to create to help this situation? So we were tasked with creating a website. Here is 
probably one of the very first diagrams that we did prior to creating our website. And it's just a very, very simple map of what we wanted to uh, provide to uh, the users of our website. You know, we wanted it to be an information hub. We wanted it to have everything that anyone would need in order to build a streetery or just to know more about streeteries. And in order to do that, we started going into a research process where we wanted to um, not exactly go really deep into the data research because time constraints and also uh, I guess we just didn't have the resources, uh, but just a temperature check to gauge concerns. So we uh, released uh, a preliminary survey um, to, uh, to PRLA, the Restaurant Association, and among other um, organizations to kind of get a temperature check on what exactly are the concerns, what exactly are the owners really concerned about, what, what, where, uh, where are they placing a lot of their attention, you know, what do they want to do with their streeteries, and how are they reacting to the city's legislation. And so we found a lot of a lot of interesting information. For example, like you know, a lot of people did reference uh, Philadelphia's outdoor dining guidelines, um, or um, or the fact that you know a lot of people you know chose to design their own streeteries over um, you know con consulting with a another design professional. Um, there was also concern about the current regulations uh, affecting their uh, already built streeteries, you know, not being allowed to keep it as a result of strict draconian legislation was, you know, always on their mind. Um, and some more information here. I mean, even with the legislation going through, you know, 82% um, of respondents would still operate a treaty even if there were requirements for significantly open walls. So, it, so like, there is, they're willing to acquiesce to a lot of these restrictions. They just need more clarity so they know exactly what they need to do so that they can continue to operate their streeteries. So, after we got all this information, we started going through the process of, okay, so what do we want to identify as DAG best practices for these streeteries? When we see a streetery, what do we find to be the most, uh, the most beautiful thing? What's the best thing? And what do we want to keep? And what do we want to hold as a kind of DAG best practice standard moving forward when creating um, our product? Um, so we look. Sorry. So we looked at you know uh, aspects such as openness, permeability, um, the prevalence of planting features. Is there heating? Is there electricity? Is there ADA access? You know, and uh, are they uh, compliant barriers? Now uh, we put a question mark next to non-compliant barriers just because the definition of a compliant barrier currently, um, I'll explain later in the presentation, is a Jersey barrier. So we're, we're still kind of confused on what exactly connotates a, a compliant. Uh, quote unquote crash proof barrier. Um, and Richard here will uh, kind of lead the section through our design experts. Yeah, so uh, at the same time that we were looking at what we thought would be best practice, we looked at some of the streeteries that were present in Philadelphia, such as Johnny Brenda's and the Greenland Cafe streeteries to take and like, look at examples that were already built, see what we could take from them and see what we should uh, take away from them moving forward to create those best practice guidelines for Philadelphia. And in that process, we modeled these streeteries in SketchUp, took some, uh, got some pictures, and also looked at other city uh, streeteries that you could see, like such as the Gramercy Tavern in New York and this Wallingford one in, in Seattle to see what they were doing in their cities that made their streeteries successful. So we could hopefully apply that in Philadelphia and in our guidelines for the city of Philadelphia. And to kind of cum uh, at the end of that process, we decide to come together and like make our own custom design. So we have an even better idea of what really constitutes a good streetery. And David here did some really nice sketches that we thought would help people get an idea of what the atmosphere would be like when you are actually experiencing these custom design streeteries or ones from other cities at eye level. So you, people would have a better idea of what these would actually look like when you were on the street. And another part of this uh, going on from from the website was to create graphics that everybody could read easily because you don't really want to go through the city like uh, bill and read that just that straight text because that's a little bit confusing, especially to people that maybe just want to look at this quickly on their phone if they're trying to set this up or if they just want to have a basic understanding of what they need to do to make their surgery compliant. So we spent a lot of time in SketchUp in Illustrator working to make these 
these graphics read it as easily as possible for people to just be able to take a quick look and then apply it to what their situation is. And they're also going to would be editable so we could change them for any DAG guidelines or city guidelines that would change in the future. All right. And part uh, move, like developing those guidelines further, we wanted to in institute them or incorporate them in a website that was really easy to use and navigate for those same reasons. So if someone was just on their phone on the street and wanted to see if their street had complied, it would be really easy for them and make this website a place where everything could be accessed for strudries really easily. And here you can see examples of some of these uh, uh, diagrams that we had created for for all these guidelines we talked about to be more legible, such as ADA access and what Jersey barriers look like and how those would actually be set up in the streets so people wouldn't be as confused. All right, so. Uh, we've shown you the regulations, we've shown you these graphics, we've shown you, you know, what exactly we want to create as a deliverable, but we haven't shown you, you know, what exactly makes a good streetery. So, as in tandem with uh, developing graphics for existing regulations at the time, we also developed uh, graphics for that best practices. And just to go into, uh, just to go into more of the specifics of what we saw to be good and how we're going to start to implement these as suggestions and as talking points. When legislation does change, we can take this to either the city council or anyone who's in charge, to, you know, at least plant the seeds it's all in their head. It's like, hey, you know, if we put these uh, these you know, best practices, you might get really good streeteries uh, you know, that work really well and are also pretty sustainable. But the first point being eating features. Now, if you've been in any streeteries around Philadelphia, um, you'll find that some of them have these heaters in them. These, we believe, are big no no. They're very dangerous. Fuel storage is often near the streetery, so it's always a fire hazard. You know, if you look at the picture up top right there, I mean, if that knocks over, it's game over. Everything's wooden fabric. So just as a safety concern, but also for environmental concern, we suggested that perhaps, you know, heating is not recommended within streetery structures. Next, uh, we talk about width. So uh, currently with city regulations, I believe that seven feet is the maximum allowed uh, width of a streetery, and that is including barriers. And just for six feet, six feet, six feet. Okay, six feet. My apology. Six feet is the uh, so is the space that we are allotted. So um, if you look at the picture up top there, the space next to those jersey barriers and that uh, iron barrier right there, that's around I'd say around four, five feet. So with six feet being given, and let's say like a jersey barrier is there, you're going to not have that much space. For seating, also for ADA. Um, so, in, in order to um, kind of, we want to start a conversation about, hey, we should be able to take up the entire parking space. You know, I'm pretty sure cars can drive on a smaller road; they just have to drive slower. And you see examples um, like right here, where they took diagonal parking space and turned that entire area into a streetery. And you know, look how great that looks. A lot of space, a lot of openness. You know, just a little more sprucing up and it could really become a feature for the city. Next, we talk about electric, electricity and lighting. So this is something that I personally noticed a lot when I was walking around Philadelphia. And these were, uh, and they were these uh, electrical lines that are running from these streetries to the buildings. And we found out that this was a huge violation of uh, the regulations and people were not allowed to have these electrical lines running across the street because it was A, it was dangerous and B, like, it was dangerous. Um, so uh, on the picture at the bottom here, we recommend that electrical connections should be secure, mainly because of the amount of ambiance and the amount of aesthetics that lighting features can bring to these streetery, especially at night. Um, but we want to propose a, 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 a best practice of, you know, these electrical features have to be well managed, they have to be safe, there needs to be a structure built um, that makes sure that there is no live wires anywhere close to the ground or anywhere close to the pedestrian right of way. Oh, excuse me. All right, and, and then we talk about permeability. All right, so obstructions or vertical features with low permeability are discouraged. That means any vertical, uh, any vertical um, feature that is facing the road should be as permeable as possible. Why? 
or traffic concerns or safety concerns, but also the fact that we are designing street areas not as extensions of restaurants on the street. We are not creating new restaurant rooms or booths or stalls on the street. We are creating a, uh, we are advocating for basically a streetscape improvement. Just because the restaurants own these spaces does not mean that they own the aesthetic of the street and they can control it however they want. There needs to be consideration um, where you know these streeteries don't become boxes on the road. They need to be integrated with the street, openness of view and safety guaranteed as well. And to hit that balance, we really need to start talking about you know what's really possible. Do we want to have full acrylic covering? You know that would block all air. Do we can we have vinyl sheets, um, wooden slats and lattices? We've seen those on streeteries, but um, like we mentioned, not very encouraged. Though. And then moving on to greenery. Um, as a uh, landscape architecture major in my undergrad, this was very personal to me. And I feel like plants make everything better. You guys can uh, argue against that. But for me, I, I really, really believe in that. And, and, and the same for streetery. Like the, um, the ability for a streetery to be upgraded, to be so much more with just an addition of plants is, I feel like, is underrated. If you look at the picture above, where there's no plant matter, as opposed to Gramercy Tavern in New York City below, where they have planting designs, where they have these planters that can hold that capacity to have these plantings and really, 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 really beautify the space. We feel it's critical to maybe provide uh, restaurant owners with a catalog of plants that, you know, that we have agreements with, that we could bring in and put into these streeteries to, you know, and also opportunities for planting design. This could be an advertisement for those restaurants. They have a really nice uh, setup. So we were considering ideas like that, but also just in, in terms of trying to integrate more of that sustainable nature and ecological nature into the streetery features. Barriers. Now, um, so according to the Philadelphia, uh, according to the city of Philadelphia, the current uh, barriers, the, uh, the only allowed barriers currently are Jersey barriers, which are filled with water or sand to wear them down, and they are deemed crash proof. Uh, therefore, they must be used in all street routes. Um, so I don't know. If, uh, well, you can all see the image at the top, and we can see that you know that's not the most best looking thing ever, uh, and. I feel like there could be something that would serve the same purpose, but look a lot better. And well, on the bottom picture, there you have it, a metal planting removable. Um, you can put in soil and it holds up to the same weight that a Jersey barrier will hold, and you can put plantings in it. So win-win, and you've solved the problem. However, the city doesn't see that as a purpose, which is a problem for us. Um, and then we're gonna, we're gonna talk about height. Right, right now with current legislation, and we want to also pr uh, propose that, you know, um, there should be a, a maximum height, and that maximum height should be around four feet to guarantee vision, but to also guarantee that, uh, that openness that we need. Because if we don't, what ends up happening is the picture at the top. We have a container box. I don't know how that's really improving the streetscape. I just think that it's, you know, you know like a semi could be parked there and would serve the same purpose visually. So, um, we're, we're trying to take into consideration so we don't have those boxes on this all over the streets, really limiting that space, really, you know, making the scale of that street feel so much more smaller and just not being a very good um, service to that streetscape. Um, now, there are some exceptions to height limits, such as umbrellas and light extensions, just because they're movable. So you can take them, move them away, and not have that hazard. And then finally, drainage and runoff. So um, you see a picture here of a very, very poorly drained streetery. Um, there's a lot of water there. It's probably going to be a lot of damage there. And that streetery is probably not going to last too long. Um, we wanted to suggest uh, very basic measures. So if anyone wanted to put roofs in, you know, there's a minimum slope, there's a maximum slope. These are just in general instructions. Drain it towards the street, not towards the sidewalk where people walk. You know, um, And to, to, to give them information and give them instructions on just uh, even Stuff like this, I feel like it's very critical to outline and just, just to point out in order to make the process so much more easier. And then finally, that was the wrap up of our best practices, but this all can be found within our website, but also within our website, you can find this creatory booklet, and that is a downloadable document containing our research, our process, and of course, the regulations visualized. 
Uh, this will be available on the Philadelphia Streaming website, as mentioned, and will be modified and updated along with any new legislation that comes through. And then finally, moving forward. So what is the future of streamers? First of all, we need clarity. There is an increasing concern for restaurant owners. I mean, you know, an increasing concern for restaurant owners has been the legality of their own streamers. I built this. It seems to be working well. But like, it's only a matter of time before the city comes here and tells me that those electrical features are illegal and I have to take down the street route. And suddenly that's just a lot of, you know, a lot of stress and a lot of just inconvenience for the restaurant owners who are just sitting there basically in a limbo. You know, they can't build new street routes, but they can't, you know, necessarily like fix their old ones. Um, and also with delays in the release of updated legislation. Originally, this uh, project was planned for summer, so the regulations were supposed to come out mid-summer so that we could get, get those regulations, get the new legislation, apply them in our draft format, and provide them to the uh, and provide them as a resource. However, they still have not been released. I have been told that they will be releasing very soon. Um, so fingers crossed. Um, and finally, the need for structure. So more than one year after the release of initial legislation, the streets department of license inspections website still don't have that information. You know, it would be very useful to have that, at least to let people know this is a possibility. You know, restaurant owners can also encounter difficulties with finding permanent instructions, as well as, uh, as I mentioned, stringent current regulations allowing for little freedom in design and you know design creative and engaging streets. And with that, uh, we conclude our presentation on streetries. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, David and, and Richard. Appreciate uh, all the hard work and, and everything went that went into this because it, it was quite a, a moving target um, as we dug into this over the summer. It, it continued to grow and change and morph as as different uh, stakeholders entered the conversation and uh, and other folks uh, got involved. Um, so if you have any comments, questions, thoughts on streeteries, I, I, I do hope that we'll get the guidance that everybody's looking for soon and, and uh, that they'll, you know, we can take some of these practices, uh, some of, you know, some of it is, is in relation to what's legal and what isn't legal. Some of it's in relation to, to design taste and preference. Um, and, and some of it is, is down to PennDOT and, uh, and a whole bunch of other, of other parties. And so, um, you know, this is certainly a, a, a tall task to, to get everything together. Um, but based on the reaction of, of both restaurants who are still in recovery mode from the pandemic and uh, and the citizens of, of the city who really enjoy uh, patronizing them. Um, hopefully, we can have something uh, have something good soon, and we can continue to to develop and advocate for for better and better solutions to make sure that our our streetscape and our street culture grows and develops and uh, isn't just a, a sea of orange barriers. Um, so, our our fourth uh, little presentation here. I want to throw it over to Kat Kendon, who, again, brought the streeteries to, to DAG to work on as a project and, and has been uh, has become a member of our steering committee and is going to be um, spearheading a public spaces committee uh, for DAG. So she, uh, she is putting together a, a group uh, that is going to be working on uh, public spaces. And so I wanted to give her a chance to Say hi, do a little recruiting, tell us what you're working on and, and, and go from there. Hi everybody, just a quick mic check I'm having computer issues, we're good? Sound good. Okay, good. So um, one of the questions that came up when we were working on the street race is this question about just looking at public space. And even though there's a lot of support for street race, it was kind of falling under this question about how are we dealing with privatization of public space? and Working on streeteries, we sort of had to put a pin in it, but decided that that was a question that we should circle back to. And so from that, we have decided to launch a public space working group. Um, I'm working with Tavis Stockweiler and Danielle Lake, and we're just starting to put this together right now. Um, to kick it off, we're going to do a handful of meetings, and the idea is sort of to get together and just talk about public events that are dealing with current events, dealing with public space. 
Um, everybody's been reading a lot of Inga Safran's writing who deals with that all the time. So we've shared a lot of her articles, but just kind of talking about what's going on and listening and sort of coming together with some sort of plan of what a working group could do and what that would look like. A number of ideas for deliverables have come up. There's a ton of really interesting case studies happening in Philadelphia right now. Um, yeah, mostly focusing on what the privatization of public space, like what's happening in Philly and rejecting that precedent and seeing what we could do in terms of advocacy around that. So if you are interested in coming and talking with us about this, next meeting is gonna be October 11th. And we're going to meet at Sister Cities Park near Logan Circle. If it rains, we're just going to pop over into the free library and keep the meeting at the same time. So one or the other will get some sort of public space. But our first conversation was really interesting. So I hope you'll come join us and check it out. We'll see what we can build from it. So if you haven't uh, been on our, on our website, that will be up shortly. Um, and so there's opportunities to get involved there. Um, please uh, dagfellow at gmail.com, our wonderful fellow Lachelle uh, is always trying to uh, air traffic control and point people in the right direction. And, and we'll send you over to, to Kat and Kat, if you wanna put your uh, email in the chat, people can come directly to you. Um, George, I wanted to get, uh, get to your question, would you comment a bit more on the issues surrounding heating and air conditioning, but also the lack of any COVID related ventilation criteria? Um, so our, our decision making was very much focused on, let's step back. Before we got to heating and ventilation, um, we had a lot of discussion about openness versus transparency. Uh, the idea that something is transparent from one line of view does not mean it remains transparent when you move 30 degrees left or 30 degrees right. And a lot of the, the transparent material becomes quite glary and, and the sight line and the connections uh, from sidewalk to street uh, and through to the, to the storefront are, are badly obscured. Um, so we began with the position that those walls needed to come down. Um, so whether it's a whole structure that's at guardrail height or below, or if it has a small you know, roof uh, with a low slope in order to give some uh, rain protection, we still wanted those walls to be open. Um, once those walls are open, you're just throwing energy out into the environment. They're really, you know, it, it is an incredibly wasteful and an incredibly, um, unnecessary in our opinion, uh, thing to do uh, to, to heat outdoor Philadelphia in, in the fall, winter. It just, it was an untenable solution in our opinion, um, not to mention the amount of uh, safety concerns it brings up with, with fuel sources, whether it is a, a flammable fuel source or um, uh, an electric fuel source that's creating uh, resistive heat. Uh, and, and creating fire hazards in, in a whole different way. Um, so that was, that was our, our opinion, um, brought it through and, and talked to a few restaurant owners about it. Uh, generally was well received. I think um, the idea of a streetery being not a four season object uh, came up a, a lot. Uh, it's something that the city has to, to deal with is are, are these four season solutions, you know, they are auxiliary dining to what is already within the restaurant. So does the streetery have to function from, you know, Thanksgiving to Easter, or can it, you know, can it come uh, when it's more temperate and, and, and appropriate for natural, comfortable outdoor dining? So that was, that was, uh, that was the goal. And again, post COVID, the idea of moving air uh, was less uh, was less of a focus, and and the openness on its own uh, supported ventilation naturally. So, any other questions for us while we're uh, while we're all gathered here together? All right. Well, we will be back October seventeenth, uh, ten a.m. Uh, to talk about the Spring Garden Connector. Um, 
So get your get your free tickets for that on our on our website, and we will uh, see everybody out at Parking Day tomorrow and at the Center for Architecture. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, uh, Ariel. Thank you, David, Richard, Kat. This was uh, this was a, a lot of fun as a project, and and we're hopeful that as regulations come out, uh, we'll, we will have been able to place our thumbs on the scales in 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 some ways in in terms of of coming up with better design solutions. Have a good night, everybody.